Let's pray together. Father, we bless your name tonight. We glorify you. We thank you because you brought us together. I want a glorious thing that you can reveal your mind, reveal your heart, and reveal your will to us. We pray, Lord, that your glory will be more and more in every life in Jesus' name. And we're praying that, Lord, you open our eyes tonight, the eyes of our spirit, that we may behold great, wondrous things in your word, in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight we're looking at Ezra chapter 3. Chapter 4, chapter 5. Ezra chapter 3, I'm reading from verses 1 to 3. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. But should then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And he set the altar upon his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. Now in chapter 4, we're looking at verse 1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel, and to the chief of the fathers, and said unto them, Let us build with you. For we seek your God, as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ezahadon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua, and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us, to build a house together. We'll, we, will, we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Then the prophets Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. As we look at these three chapters tonight, 
you will see what they were doing. It was a difficult time. It was a time when the adversaries went against them. Anytime there is a great open door, there's always opposition. Anytime there is a great opportunity, there is always opposition. In a personal life, single life, in a family, in a local church, in the whole church together, there is open door, there is opportunity, and there is great possibility of achieving something for God in your personal life, in the church you belong to. And then opposition will rise. That is where many people stop. Because if this were of God, why will there be opposition? If this were of God, why will the adversaries rise up? If this were of God, why would I be going through what I'm going through? But you understand tonight that times of great outpouring are also times of great opposition. That's why tonight we're looking at this message, advancing the kingdom in times of adversity. Advancing the kingdom in times of Adversity. We're coming to Daniel chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 25. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. It says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks look at this the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times look at that the streets will be built again the walls will be built again the temple will be built again and the will of God will be done. And it says, it will be done in times of trouble, in times of adversity, in times of opposition. Look at Matthew chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 8. It says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. That is the rumors of wars the calamities that will be happening, the disasters that will be observed in many parts of the world, Jesus said, prior to his coming, very near the end of time, all these will be the beginning of sorrows. Look at verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end. That's me. I said that's me. You will endure to the end in Jesus' name. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Look at verse 14. In the midst of all those disasters, in the midst of the wars and the rumors of wars, in the midst of those earthquakes and volcanoes, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of all those calamities that will be happening in the world, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come it's reassuring us that the lord will be with us whatever the circumstances in the world the lord will be with you and we don't need to stop the work of god just because there's a challenge there there's a problem there there are disasters there, 
and the things will reach, and the things will hear, and the beginning of sorrows, and everything that goes on in the world, the work of God will continue. Ezra chapter 6, we're looking at two verses there. Ezra chapter 6, look at verse 7. Ezra chapter 6, verse 7. Let the work of the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Verse 12. And the God that has caused his name to dwell there destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter or to destroy this house of God which is at Jerusalem. Are you hear an amen there? Yeah. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done was speech. Eventually support came. Eventually, a decree came that nothing will hinder the progress of the building of the house of God, which they had been struggling to build and our great challenges and difficulties. So tonight, we're looking at these three chapters and we're looking at advancing the kingdom in times of adversity. Advancing the kingdom in times of adversity. There are three things we're looking at. In chapter 3, we're looking at the awakening of the ambassadors of the kingdom. The awakening. The ambassadors of the kingdom are waking up and knowing we're called for a service and we're called for a commission. And whatever may be our surrounding, and whatever may be our situation, this work of the kingdom will be done. It will be done effectively in Jesus' name. The awakening of the ambassadors of the kingdom. Point number two, that you'll find in chapter four. The accusation of the adversaries of the kingdom. They're not your adversaries. They're not my adversaries. They're the adversaries of the kingdom. And they bring up accusation, thinking that that accusation will weaken your hand, weaken my hand, will stop us, but nothing will stop us. This army of the Lord is unstoppable. You are unstoppable. And you must let the enemy know, you must let the adversaries know that there is something implanted in your heart that you and the rest of the church were unstoppable in Jesus' name. The accusation of the adversaries of the kingdom. Point number three, the advocates of the advancement of the kingdom. The advocates, the people that rise up, and the people that say we must rise up, and we must move ahead and forge ahead and get the work done that we should let nothing on earth, nothing from the sea, nothing from the sky stop us. And there's so much of advocates come forth to encourage us, to stir us up, to build us up, to put fire within us and to make us know that if we keep on looking unto the Lord, this work will prosper in our hands. It will prosper in your hands in Jesus' name. Number three, the advocates of the advancement of the kingdom. Point number one. We come to Ezra chapter 3. As we look at Ezra chapter 3, there are three things here. Number one, their unity on the word. 
the unity on the word. Look at Ezra chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 1. Ezra chapter 3, verse 1. It says, And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together, look at this, as one man. There were many, it was a multitude, and yet one mind, one goal, one vision, one ambition, one aspiration, one direction, one consecration, one Lord, they gathered themselves together as one man, in one accord. That is unity. What was their unity based on? Look at verse 2. They stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priest, and Jer Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon as it is written. That's what the unity was based on. As it is written. They looked at the word of God and they said, no personal idea here, no personal opinion here, and there is nothing of the tradition of man here. We're looking at it as it is reaching the word of God. One man united. They were all united on God's word. That's what the Lord is calling us today to. That will be united on the word of God. Nehemiah chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man. That's the secret of success in the work of the Lord. That's the secret of success in the calling, in the commission the Lord has given us. As one man, all united, but on the word of the Lord. And it says, into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. You see that? They were united as one man. They were in one accord. On the word of God, bring the book. Throw away the personal opinions and throw away the traditions of men and throw away all those false prophecies. Bring the book and let's unite together as one man. Isaiah chapter 52. In Isaiah chapter 52, I'm reading from verse 8. The unity, their unity on the word. Our unity on the word. Isaiah 52, I'm reading from verse 8. Thy watchmen in the plural. Thy preachers in the plural, thy prophets in the plural, thy pastors and teachers of the word in the plural shall lift up the voice, one voice. And with the voice together shall they sing. They shall see eye to eye. That's unity. All of us, hundreds of pastors, thousands of preachers, all united together, they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. The people of Judah and Jerusalem had been in captivity for 70 years. Now they were returning, and as they returned and the Lord brought back again Zion, they saw eye to eye, and they were all united on the word of God. Such unity will remain in our midst in Jesus' name. It is there already. The Lord will strengthen it. I said the Lord will strengthen it. First Corinthians chapter 1. Read from verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that she all speak the same thing. That she all speak the same thing. That's the very foundation of working for God. That we all preach repentance. That we all emphasize righteousness. That we all believe and preach restitution. And that we all understand, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that we all uphold the word of God, follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That we all speak the same thing. You are working with the children, you are working with the youth, you are working with the women, you are working with the men, you are working with the campus, anywhere that we all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together, joined together, not loosely, joined together perfectly, together in the same mind, in the same judgment. Let's come back to Ezra. We see number one here, their unity on the word. Number two, the uniqueness of their work. The uniqueness of their work. A kind of work that the Lord had committed into their hands that no other person could do. And no other person will infiltrate and say, I want to, you know, help you do part of it. This was peculiarly theirs, the uniqueness of their work. I'm reading from Ezra chapter 3, and I read the first line of verse 3. And they set the altar upon his basis. Remember, you are doing it as it is written. And as you go back to the writings of Moses for them, you will see the kind of stones they should use. And this was unique. It was an altar, not like the altars of any of the other nations. It was unique. Look at verse 4, first part. And they kept also the feast of tabernacles, as it is reaching. They were meticulous looking at the word of God and building the altar as it is reaching and keeping the feast as it is reaching. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, and the sons of Judah together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Enadach, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. They concentrated on the work. This is unique. When you understand that your ministry is unique, you're a preacher, you're unique, you're a pastor, you're unique, you're a singer, you are un you are unique, or you are an usher, you are unique, you are in the secret, you are unique, or you are in another section, but you are sending forth the word, and you are spreading the word of the gospel, and you know that your place is unique. You don't say, if I'm not there, another person will be there. If I don't do it, another person will do it. You see yourself doing something unique for the kingdom of God that will detect your consecration, your conviction, your commitment unto the work. That uniqueness the Lord expects of us. Look at verse 10, first part. And when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel. They had laid the foundation. And the foundation was very important. And the Lord has given us uh, something very important to lay the foundation. The foundation of salvation. The foundation of Jesus Christ in the heart, in the mind, in the lives of the people. We're told in Second Chronicles chapter 5, reading from verse 18. The uniqueness of our work. The uniqueness of our commission. The uniqueness of our ministry. 
the uniqueness of our calling, the uniqueness of your own involvement in the work of the Lord. That you don't say, I may be there, I may not be there, you must be there. I thank God you are there. I say, thank God you are there. I pray that that consciousness of the uniqueness of your work, the Lord will write it upon every heart in Jesus' name. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us, he has given us, he has given us, he gave you, he gave me, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Pharisees cannot do this one. Sadducees cannot do this one. Traditionalists cannot do this one. Religious theologians cannot do this one. And the people who say, I'm a founder of this, I'm a founder of this, if they are not born again, if they are not called into this ministry, it's unique for the people who are called of God. It says in verse 19 to which that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto tell me and has committed unto tell me out aloud unto us the word of reconciliation it was paul the apostle that wrote this but his gun is now in heaven and the lord has you know the salvation of uh, and Nigerians, it's not in the hand of Paul now. It's not through the preaching of Paul now he's gone. And the salvation of uh, countries in West Africa, any country in Africa, is not in the hands of John Wesley now. He's gone. And the salvation of people in your community is not in the hands of Billy Graham now. It's gone. They have gone to have their rewards. But now there is a uniqueness of your calling that he has now called us to do it. If you don't do it, nobody else will do it. Thank God you will do it. Thank God I will do it. You will do your part in Jesus' name. It says in verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's church, be ye reconciled unto God. Be ye reconciled unto God. We're coming to Jude, verse 3. Jude, verse 3. In Jude, verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I give all diligence or right unto you, of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Every generation of preachers must earnestly contend for the faith. Paul cannot come back and contend for the faith here in our country. And the preachers who have gone, the great reformers who have gone, they cannot come back today. It is for the preachers of this time and this day that will take the touch of the gospel and to take the totality, the entirety of the gospel and stand for it with our very lives that she will earnestly contain for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Number one their unity on the word. Number two, the uniqueness of their work. Number three, the usefulness of the workmen. The usefulness of the workmen. We're looking at Ezra chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 6. Ezra chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 6. It tells us in verse 6, it says, from the first day of the seventh month, began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. For the foundation of the temple 
of the Lord was not yet laid. That was noted there so they will know that there's still something essential, something important, something indispensable, something a non-negotiable they still have to do. Look at verse 10, the first part. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. Now they, they, they did it. They knew this must be done. The foundation of the temple. We're coming to verse 11 and we're looking at the latter part. The second sentence there. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. The foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And because of that importance, the usefulness of those workmen Psalm 11, I'm reading from verse 3. Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If we forget that salvation is foundational, repentance is foundational, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is foundational, Following peace with God and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord is foundational. And being obedient to the word of God, everything we know by the grace of God in the power of the Spirit of God is foundational. If those foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Luke chapter 6 verse 47. Luke chapter 6, verse 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. It's like a man which built a house and digs deep and laid the foundation on a rock. The foundation on a rock, as we minister and as we talk to members of the church and as we train the workers, as we encourage preachers like ourselves, we must not forget that obedience to the word is foundational. He that cometh to me and heareth these words of mine, and he doeth them, he obeys them, is conscious of the fact that this is the very foundation of the Christian life. If you say you are born again, show me by the life you live. If you say you are sanctified, show me by the surrenderedness of missiveness you have unto the Lord. And then he says in that verse 48, it's like a man that built a house and he dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the streams beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Your Christian life will have foundation. Your ministry will remain on the foundation. You will not labor in vain. Verse 49, But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation builds a house upon the earth, against which the stream did be vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin, the collapse of that house was great. My house will not collapse. Your ministry will not collapse. Your calling will not collapse. It will be on a strong foundation and the Lord will help us always remember if the foundations be destroyed, watch and the righteous view. We'll come to point number two now. The accusation of the adversaries of the kingdom. The accusation of the adversaries of the kingdom. 
Let's come to Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 1. Ezra chapter 4 from verse 1. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, unto the Lord God of Israel. What are you building? Build it unto the Lord God of Israel. How are you ministering? Minister as unto the Lord God of Israel. What are you doing? Do it as unto the Lord God of Israel. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the, and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you. For we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. And Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. It's wonderful when you know your ground. It's wonderful when you know your calling. It's wonderful when you know the qualification it takes to be a builder for God. You're building lives. You're building for eternity. You're building families. You're building disciples. You're building Christians. You're building the flock of God. And it's wonderful for you to know what it takes. The qualification. Spiritual qualification. It's wonderful for you to understand spiritual work cannot be done by carnal means. And so these people recognized and they said, No, you cannot do. Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. Then they said, But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the, uh, the king of Persia, has commanded us. As we look at this chapter, there are three things. Number one, the adversaries of Judah. And the Jesus men, Jesus men, the disciples of Jesus, Jesus men, the followers of Jesus, Jesus men, the people that believe in Jesus and they have received the commission from the Lord Jesus men, there are adversaries, the adversaries of Judah and the adversaries of Jesus men. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 11. Nehemiah chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. That's always the intention of the adversaries and cause the work to cease and make the work to stop. They didn't like building anything for the glory of God. And so, as adversaries, they are in a hurry to make sure that they destroy the work of the Lord. Did they all die out in the Old Testament? Those adversaries come to First Corinthians chapter 16. The adversaries of Judah and the adversaries of, the, of Jesus' men, the Jesus' men. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 9. For there is a great door, an effectual, a great door, an effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. It said, a great door is opened unto me, to preach the gospel here and preach the gospel here and bring many souls to Christ and these souls to develop them, to disciple them and bring them to maturity in Christ. Although the open doors are there, he says, the adversaries are many 
as it was then, so it is even today. The adversaries are there, but we are going to overcome them. We are going to overcome them. You will overcome in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 15. Luke chapter 21, verse 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom. I receive that. I said I receive that. It will be unto me as Jesus has said. It will be unto me as Jesus my Lord has said. He will give you mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. Adversaries will not stop you. Adversaries will not crush you. Adversaries will not remove your consecration in Jesus' name. You have greater wisdom than all your adversaries. You'll have greater courage than all your adversaries. Because Jesus said, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries put together will not be able to resist or give safe. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 27. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. The same unity we have here when we're together in your local church, that trinity will continue. In the house fellowship, that unity will continue. In every region and every stage, that unity will continue in Jesus' name. Standing fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the face of the gospel. Look at this. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries terrified by your adversaries why are people terrified by their adversaries they forget the promise of christ that i'll give you a mouth i'll give you wisdom they think the adversary can bring them to shame no adversary will bring you to shame they think the adversary will steal away their conviction no adversary will steal away your conviction it says that you are nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Number one, the adversaries of Judah and the Jesus men. Number two, the accusation against Judah and the justified. Those of us who are justified by faith and by the grace of God we are walking in the fullness of the light that the Lord has given us, justified, justified. Your sins are forgiven. Your soul is saved. The Lord has set you free. And the accusation of the enemy will still be there. The accusation against Judah and the justified. All those accusations, you will trample over them. I said you will trample over them. No accusation will stop you. No false accusation will destroy you. All the, all the cleansing the Lord has given you will be permanent in Jesus' name. Look at Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 6. Ezra chapter 4. We're reading from verse 6. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of, Jer of Judah and Jerusalem. Accusation, accusation. The devil is the accuser of the brethren, and sometimes sinners are the accuser of the brethren. 
Sometimes members of your family who are not born again and they don't like the faith you have now, they bring accusations. Sometimes they can even write something, you know, either in the media or in the papers, and then when you read that about yourself, you say, where did this come from? When did I do this? Don't worry, it's the accusation of the adversary, but you will overcome. I said, you will overcome where you will get to, you will get there. What you will do, you will do. Accusation of the adversaries will not stop your progress in Jesus' name. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 13. Acts of the Apostles chapter 24, verse 13. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. They accuse, they accused Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle said, I've heard about the accusation. I've seen everything they wrote about me. I've seen what the Jews are saying about me. And can you see, it is all false. They cannot prove it. If they can prove it, let them come here and tell us the day and the time and the hour and the place. When I did that, it says, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. When there's an accusation like that, false accusation, then somebody said, did you hear? What's that? They said something about you. And then the fellow repeats what he said, and he adds his own. Because that's how, how, how things happen. When somebody has had a little, when he's going to tell the story, he adds a little. Again, to so another person, that one adds a little. And they add and add and add, and they said, this is what they said you have done. And nobody can prove it. And nobody can say they saw you doing the scene. And then you take that personal. I cannot go out for evangelism because of the way everybody is looking at me now. I cannot preach because of the way everybody is looking at me now. I cannot teach the scripture. Next Sunday they wanted me to teach, but I cannot. How can I? Because once I stand there, everybody is looking at me as if I'm a criminal. And nobody can prove it. And you allow here say to stop you and to ground you. And then you are gone. And we cannot see you again. I will see you again. Shake it off. Shake it off. The accusation of the adversary against the justified. Your conscience tells you, my sins are forgiven. And your life is clear and clean before the Lord. Where did this come from? Don't worry about that. You will be an overcomer. Look at First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 16. First Peter chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 16. It says, having a good conscience, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. They will be ashamed. You will not be ashamed. I will not be ashamed. I'm born again. I, I, I can't hear the people who are born again. My conscience is clear. Uh, you know, sometimes when the devil really wants to destroy somebody, Something that you did 30 years ago. And now, that time you prayed, and God forgave you, and God cleansed you. And you're free. And you've been going on. And the Lord has shown that he has forgiven you. Because you have the witness in your heart. And sometimes, you're even preaching. And it's bringing very great effectiveness. And the people don't like the way God is assisting you and helping you now. And so, that thing that happened 30 years ago, they'll go and dig it up. And then, uh, they'll tell somebody, they won't come and tell you directly, and tell another person again, until they will instigate one of the accusers, the adversaries, go and tell him. 
go and tell him. Send a text message to him and tell him, I heard. I've just heard. I knew. I just knew that this is what you did at that time. And then a text came in and it's, it's anonymous. You don't even know the number. You don't know the name. And then you read that and you remember. And you remember that that thing really happened. But that thing had been buried by the Almighty God. And because of these people, you cannot sleep at night. Tonight, you will sleep well. Because all those sins, they are gone. They are no more in your life in Jesus' name. But some people, they begin to tremble. I cannot go out. I don't know how many people have searched. I don't know how many people have seen this one. No matter how many of them have seen it on earth, heaven has cleared your record. That's why it says you have a good conscience. That whereas they speak evil of you as evil doers, they will be ashamed that accuse you falsely of your good conversation. Give me a good, good amen. Look at First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. The Lord will be glorified in your life. But let none of you suffer as a murderer in the present tense. If you've done it before and God has forgiven you, don't continue. Or as a thief in the present time. If you've done it before and God has forgiven you, don't continue. Or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any of you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The glory of the Lord will rest upon your life. Number one here, the adversaries of Judah and the Jesus men. Number two, the accusation against Judah and the justified. Number three, the audacity of Judah and the joint heirs. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're bold. I said we're bold. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're courageous. We're joint here with Christ. And we are going on the path, the narrow path that leads to heaven. And nothing will stop any of us in Jesus' name. The audacity, the boldness, the courage, the fortitude of Judah and the joint heirs. Let's come back to Ezra chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 3. Ezra chapter 4. We're looking at verse 3. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. Remember, they came from captivity, but they didn't bring with them the spirit of the captive. Remember, they came from Babylon, but they didn't bring the cowering down by the Babylonians. They all they left that aside. They were not wearing the clothes of discouragement and the clothes of despair and the clothes of fear and the clothes of not knowing where to be because we've been in captivity for seven years for 70 years as we came back now and all these people that are talking to them were free people they've been in the land and they came and they said we're serving the same god they said no you are not they forgot about their captivity forget about your past i said forget about your past Forget about the captivity of the past and stand like a real child of God, a joint heir with Christ, and nothing will crush your spirit in Jesus' name. He said, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel. 
my mind will be like that. My heart will be like that. I will not be crushed. Somebody there, I will not be crushed. I will stand firm. And honestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. You didn't want to do that one? You'll do it in Jesus' name. Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 20. Then answered I them. They didn't expect. They're not expecting us to answer them. They're, they're telling us, once they say shut up, they didn't expect we'll answer them. Well, we'll answer them. I said, well, we'll answer them. Once they say quit, don't do it again. Once they say go and sit down. Once they say, who are you? Didn't you come from captivity? Who are you to open your mouth? They expect we will retreat in shame. Those days are gone. You'll be a conqueror. You will overcome. So, when they say shut up, you'll answer them. I will answer them. Say it aloud. I will answer them. And what you, what you say in church, don't forget when you get your community. So when you get your community and then they say something, you must remember what you have said. I will answer them. You will answer them. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 20. Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. I like that. I like that. When it comes to my turn, that's how I say it to them. When it comes to my turn, that's how they tell me to shut up. And then I will tell them with a stronger voice, you are the adversary of the kingdom. Shut up. They will shut up. Yeah. Romans chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 17 Romans chapter 8 reading from verse 17 and if children then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together and as heirs look at verse 15 for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Do you have the spirit of bondage? Who has the spirit of bondage there? It's cast out already in Jesus' name. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, everybody, Abba, Father. Second Timothy chapter one, reading from verse six. Second Timothy chapter one, I'm reading from verse six. It says in verse six, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us, tell me, the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Verse 7. We're going to read it together. And you put me instead of us. One, two, three, go. Amen. Look up here. You know, when somebody tells you something that is not true, and you accept it, and you repeat it yourself over and over and over, the primary school teacher said, I'm dull. I cannot take in anything. I cannot learn. Go out and be a mechanic. Go out and be a, a, uh, a carpenter. Go out and be a cleaner. 
because you cannot make it in education if that child repeats it over and over and over to herself she'll feel that way he'll think that way he'll approach his studies that way and according to what the teacher has said which he has accepted he may not make it in life but if that student that little boy will say the teacher doesn't know me he's wrong i know i have a good brain i know i have a good mind what he said i cannot do i will do somebody there I will do. And then he repeats to himself over and over and over. And he says, I'm not dull, I'm bright. That child will come up in life. The same thing with the believer. If the believer will say, even though you might have fear, even though because of your preconditioning, all the things around you had conditioned you, that you know you are a coward, you cannot make it, you are timid, you are extrovert, you are introvert, whatever. If you say, every, you wake up in the morning, for God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Then you go out, something is about to happen. And the fear that used to grip you in the past is about coming. Say, stop it there. For God has not given me, I thought you'll be saying it for yourself, the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. By the time you repeat it over and over and over, the spirit of the living God will make it a reality in your life. You'll be courageous. The audacity of Judah and the joint ears. I come to point number three now. I will come to Ezra chapter five. The advocates of the advancement of the kingdom. The advocates of the advancement of the kingdom. We're coming to Ezra chapter five. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. In verses 1 and 2, then the prophets, Haggai, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, than then Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. He began, you'll begin. What you have not done before, you'll begin to do. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. It takes one person to lead the way. It takes one person to throw away the gap of discouragement and despair and then put his mind to work. It takes one person to lead the way. And as they saw him leading the way, it says the prophets of God also rose up, helping them. Get started, others will come. Get started, others will join. Three things. Number one, the courage of awakened reformers. The courage of awakened reformers. These prophets of God, they woke up and they are waking out of their sleep. It's like, what are we doing? Why are we giving chance to these people who are the accusers and the adversaries? Why are we giving chance to them? Why are we retreating? Why are we ashamed? And they rose up, awakened reformers. You will be like that. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. 
They take the light in approaching God, but they were nominal. And God said, Arise and lift up your voice. Look at chapter 62, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 6. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. We will not stop. We will not be driven back. And nothing will shut us up in Jesus' name. We'll never hold our peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. Keep not silence. Number one, the courage of awakened reformers. You have heard of Martin Luther? He was a reformer. And that's what brought the reformation. That's what has brought the Protestant faith today. The just shall live by faith. If he had been coward and he kept quiet, the Roman Catholic Church was very strong, formidable, and he even threatened him. He would have died. But then he rose up and he cried out. That's how we have billions of people now that know about the way of salvation. And through you, John, that man is gone. Uh, man, Martin Luther is gone. You are the man of the hour. You are the woman of the hour. And nothing will stop you. Even a body, even a congregation, even a group of people as strong as the Roman Catholic Church of the time of uh, Martin Luther, even if they send in any organization like that, thinking that they will crush you, it will not work. Yeah. You will rise up and you will do the work of God in Jesus' name. Yeah. Number two, the constancy of addicted repairers. Those who want to repair the way of the Lord and they are addicted to it. Those who want to earnestly contend for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, and they are addicted to it, nothing will stop you. Me, nothing will stop me. I said nothing will stop me. Ezra chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 5. Ezra chapter 5 verse 5. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them to cease. They could not cause them to stop. They could not cause them to shut up. They could not cause them to pack all their equipments and go back home. They could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius and then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. Thank God nothing will stop you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Addiction to the work of God. Addiction to the calling the Lord has given you. Addiction to the assignment the Lord has given you. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. Chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, ye you know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry. They have addicted themselves to the ministry. A person that knows the value of the ministry the importance of the ministry, the calling the Lord has given you, and you're addicted to that, you'll be constant in that work in Jesus' name. Nobody will stop this great movement of God that is to reach everywhere and to turn many hearts unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 39. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verse 39. Open your Bible. Acts, chapter 5, verse 39. But if this, if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply 
ye be found even to fight against God? If it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Amen? Look up here. Are you of God? I mean yourself as a person. Yourself as a brother. Yourself as a sister. I can't hear you. If you be of God, nothing can overthrow you. This church, Deeper Life Bible Church, in all sincerity, is it of God? Are you sure? If this church be of God, it says nothing can overthrow it. Your salvation, is it of God? The life you are living now, is it of God? If your salvation be of God, nothing can overthrow it. You're being here today. And your privilege of serving the Lord and the calling you have and the place where God has placed and positioned you now is it of God? Yeah. If it be of God, nothing can overthrow it. Yeah. Nothing will push you down. Yeah. Nothing will drive you away. Yeah. Nothing will crush you. Yeah. All those adversaries of your progress they will come to shame in Jesus' name. Number three now, the conviction of aflamed restorers. The conviction of aflamed restorers. Restorers who are on fire. Reformers who are on fire. Repairers who are on fire. On fire for the Lord. The conviction of aflamed restorers. Come to chapter 5. And I'm reading here from verse 11. Chapter 5, verse 11. And thus they returned us answer, saying, We are the servants of God, of the God of heaven and earth. And built the house that was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. They said, another king had done this before. It was destroyed. And we now are the servants of God. And we rise up. And we're going to build what has been destroyed. Jesus Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He passed it on to the apostles. And those apostles, they built the church. And then they written everything for us in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And people like Martin Luther, they built. And John Wesley, he built. And Charles Finney, he built. And Spurgeon, he built. And they have gone and we have risen up instead of them now in this generation. And we're saying, like they built we are going to build. We are going to build something strong. Something mighty. Something that will touch everywhere in Jesus' name. We are rising up with the flame of God in our hearts. With the power of the Spirit of God in our life. And we are going to do it until it is finalized in Jesus' name. Habakkuk. Chapter 2, Habakkuk chapter 2, I read from verse 4, Habakkuk chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4, Behold his soul which is lifted up in him is not upright. All those adversaries, all those accusers, all the people that want to stop you, their soul that is lifted up in them is not upright, but they just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. You will not die. The just shall live by faith. You will not backslide. The just shall live by faith. You live by faith. I live by faith. She lives by faith. We all live by faith. 
And this gospel the Lord has given us, we carry it everywhere. What's going to be the result? Look at verse 14. Verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All of us who are here, we go through the whole town. All those who are hearing, they go through every stage and nothing is stopping us. And we take this word of salvation and we go everywhere in this country and in the other countries. All the believers there hearing the word of God, they go through, it says, the earth, our country, your country, your stage, our stage, shall be filled with the knowledge of the, of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Any amen? amen? Verse 20. Verse 20. But the Lord in his, is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let all those accusers now keep quiet before him. Let all those adversaries, let them be silent right now in Jesus' name. The Lord will fill you. The Lord will saturate you. And the Lord will live mighty in your heart in Jesus' name. You are the temple of the Lord. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth give silence before him. All your yokes are broken. All your chains are broken. And everything that stood in the way to stop you before, everything is taken away. Now you go forth and you preach the word of God. You are not going to take care or take note of any adversary. And the word of the Lord will fill the whole land as the waters cover the sea in Jesus' name. You are the man of the hour. You are the woman of the hour. Rise up and be strong in the Lord in Jesus' name. Rise up now, rise up now and tell the Lord... This is for me today. The Lord has called me and the Lord has renewed the calling upon my life. Let all those adversaries and let all those accusers, let them be silent before the Lord. And now you have the liberty. This is your day. A day of opportunity and a day of outpouring and a day of breakthrough. You will succeed. You will not fail. You will not fail.